It's my very great pleasure on this 18th day of the month of July 2020 with 40 degrees in Paris to welcome you all to this uh, third um, webinar in our series on reweaving the web of life, a very interesting and vital series. It's my job today just to tell you a few of the housekeeping rules, which are very similar, simple, um, as is with all uh, Zoom meetings. The first one is if you're not talking, please keep your, your, microphone, your microphone closed. As you've noticed, we are recording this session, which means that you can refer to it later and it will be posted on the Pass It On Network uh, YouTube channel. I just want to tell you how the 50-50 online conversations for the Pass It On Network work. The idea is that we would like as much participation as possible so that there, there is an inter, there's an exchange between the people who are presenting and the people who are participating. So there will be two guests in the first part and then a, a space and time for questions and insights. The session will last about one hour, 15 minutes, but if you have a hard stop at top of the hour, please feel free to go and know, as I said, that this will be recorded and it will be on our Pass It On, our Pass it on YouTube channel. If you have a question, please just pop it into the, uh, into the, either into the chat or into the participation bundle. And um, we will share later on in the presentation a link for you to express how you have enjoyed this, this session, because it's always very, very interesting for us to know so that we can keep improving and reproduce um, new sessions that are more and more to your liking. And with that, I would like to hand over to Jan Hybley, who's our co-founder. And... Uh, just our special guide and especially in this particular series that we're doing now we're in number three of a four-part series and uh, it was basically conceived by Jan so Jan let us hand over to you so that you can do the continuation between the first second and third and tell us what's going to happen in the fourth <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll certainly, at the, toward the end of the session, uh, describe that sequence. Uh, Peter Whitehouse, who is going to be the lead uh, in August, uh, will uh, share that conversation. Uh, this, this, this is all about transformation, transformation of attitudes. Uh, a lot of what we do with Pass It On Network is, is uh, reflect together uh, about the ways in which our mindsets have shifted. And uh, here, I think we are thinking about what was our attitude toward nature uh, as we were growing up? Uh, what, what, what was, what, what, where were people, uh, human beings in relationship to all that was around us in our supportive environment? Uh, and uh, in, in contrast to that, how do what what would what would we feel now, and what do we want to leave for the future? It seems as us as if it's extremely important, having recognized that we're part of an interdependent web of all life, that we now acknowledge and live live and shift for our 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 legacy, uh, so that others will recognize that we're part of an interdependent web of all living beings, just part of that. Uh, I first met Kathy Bailey, who is going to be uh, leading us uh, uh, our, our interview uh, with uh, uh, Annie and Deirdre Bailey uh, uh, about their extraordinary uh, work that they are doing here. Uh, and it all has to do with making well-being for all living beings. Uh, I first met her in 2013, which was the year that Moira and I started the Pass It On Network. She came to Yarmouth, Massachusetts, which is where uh, I live uh, and now, and uh, she was going to be the director of aging services. And oh, what a ride it was for all of us. Uh, uh, 
Jerry Bedard, who's on the, on the uh, call today, is the chair of our age-friendly Yarmouth uh, management team. Uh, and we, we, we created, uh, we developed, helped to develop with the support from our city selectmen and our, our, which is our city council and our mayor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of what was needed in order to be able to be age friendly for all ages, because what was different about Kathy in relationship to the international age friendly community development process was that we wanted to be sure it was friendly for all ages, that intergenerational relationships were critical uh, and that uh, they would be protected and supported as we went along. She also brought in a very deep global perspective. She had been a Fulbright Fellow in China uh, where they had begun work on age-friendly communities. And uh, that she managed to develop a wonderful contract with them. So we would go back and forth with people at the University, Zhejiang University in China on age-friendly community work. Uh, so uh, I won't bother you with all of the creative things that she did in this role as Director of Aging Services, including developing the Intergenerational Model United Nations process, which she explained to the landed working group on aging uh, a, 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 a few years later. Uh, other countries have copied her, uh, copied the work of Yarmouth in that way. But I think that what's most important is that Kathy moved on, uh, and I've forgotten, 1919 maybe, uh, and <clears throat> to uh, work as, uh, with our Cape Cod healthcare system uh, in charge of community benefits, community giving. But then of course, we hit COVID hit. Uh, she was furloughed and later laid off. And she was trans, she, she really has uh, expanded her views of aging from human beings as the center of her focus to all beings cohabitating in this place called Earth. This chapter of her life is about being the, being the change and co-creating that change with others. And this is certainly part of uh, what, why we find her as shown by her background, hugging trees, talking to plants, digging in the dirt, and listening deeply to all human beings. She calls herself not a, a crone and a bandrui, and I'll allow you to, to, or ask you to explain what that means, Kathy, uh, and then to introduce uh, you, the intergenerational aspect of this program which is to welcome uh, Deirdre and Annie Bailey. Thank you, thank you, Jan. And um, thank you to the Pass It On Network for this opportunity to um, share a new vision for the world coming from our younger generation. I really appreciate that intergenerational support and the wisdom that could come today from all of you to these young people. Um, uh, so, Jan, you, you kind of set me up to explain Crone. So, you know, here I am. I turned 60. I was displaced from the workforce and um, took a couple of tours of duty with the Pass It On Network and Jeff Rubin's crew and different tribes around the world that were discovering um, different issues. And uh, in a, earlier I mentioned uh, Margaret in her um, coaching of me with the Pass It On Network. Uh, one night I shared with her, geez, I just really want to focus on food and water and well-being. It wasn't that I was done with aging advocacy. I just couldn't feel anymore that we could resolve anything um, for aging services unless we started to resolve what we were doing to Mother Earth. Um, you know, we could, if we don't have clean water and we don't have healthy food, uh, and if we don't have healthy um, trees and plants and wild animals, how, how can we have well-being at any age? Um, so then, of course, um, I happened to be 
in the situation of watching these two young women, Annie and Deirdre, um, moving forward with their relationship and their marriage and their dreams. You know, they were teaching, both teaching. Both of them have um, environmental underpinnings in their um, uh, college educations. And so, you know, uh, this generation of millennials that went through schooling, uh, thanks to the great professors of liberal arts around the world, um, you know, really got their feet wet um, more so than my generation in understanding nature and what was going on with the climate in a way that really had them more connected. And I really, I really was craving that connection as well. So for the Crone piece, thank goodness for Saging International, one of the Pass It On Network's um, partners, uh, they offered a workshop on Crohn's and that was just welcoming me to being 60 and older and what was my wisdom? And that wisdom, Peter, brought me back to um, my Celtic roots and the ancestors and the honoring of nature that was once found in Ireland um, before Christianity. And so I, I've been taking a walk on that wild side. And the band Drew is, is uh, a druid was, you know, more the wisdom keeper, the professor, the uh, guru of of the old um, Celts and uh, the brand Drewy was the female side of that. So yeah, I I joined the world of what Jan once said to me was the woohoos, um, and I'm actually so grateful to be a woohoo now because it's really where we need to be on this earth. We all need to get a little more woohoo. So in introducing the girls, because this yeah yeah Petey love that we all need to get. It's really about connecting with our spiritual self and our spiritual self is connected to this planet and we need the earth and it needs us. So move off of just looking at aging as a human and think about the aging earth uh, just for today. And I think that'll help you understand the girls a bit. So Deirdre and Annie, you need to take yourself off mute. And I don't have your bios in front of me, but if there's something either one of you think you want to say about yourself that would add to this lecture, could you do that? Or maybe just to talk about what university you each went to and a key takeaway for how yeah, that we affects. Can, we yeah. can just do a quick intro. Um, okay. My name is Annie Bailey and I um, graduated from St. Lawrence University uh, with a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Studies. And um, I graduated and went on to work for a horse vet and then became a school teacher and sort of left the environmental studies part of my life behind, um, but have a lifetime of like going back and forth between eating meat and cheese and being vegetarian and being vegan. Um, and actually throughout COVID, I started, um, doing a deep dive into large ag and what that means for uh, human health as well as um, the environment and ended sort of with, well, it's not for everyone. I definitely wanted to be vegan. Um, and that sort of led me down the path of wanting to start an animal sanctuary. And um, my partner came along with me. <laughs> um, and I'll allow her to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Deirdre. Um, I'm so thankful to be here today. I think that this model of Pass It On Network is so important and vital for creating like academic spaces that are outside of the institution where you can really foster creative thought and create opportunities for people to communicate in a way that's not um, enmeshed in a certain or particular set of economics, like higher ed somehow implicates. Um, so thank you so much for creating this space for us to present at and be a part of. Um, I'm really here to support Annie. She's the one who turned me on to the vegan stuff. Always been a bit of an environmentalist and an artist and knowing that the way that systems, food systems and mostly all systems in the United States are not functioning to create like optimal health and well-being for people or animals. So I thought I was already really cool and extreme. And then I met Annie and she's called me to be even more extreme in my politics and create this space for people to have, um, people and animals to have a sanctuary space that kind of like maintains um, 
the opportunity to explore new modes of thinking or, or new ways of living and that we can like as community create different systems even though sometimes it seems like that's not within our power so sanctuary typically belong to like a religious space and now there, there, there's a huge movement in animal rights to create sanctuary for animals and people so that you can kind of have that same tuck away from the world and think about how the world could be different which we need to have back right. to you yeah <laughs> thank you deandra thanks danny uh so we'll move on with the questions that we built for today and uh we'll start with the intergenerational piece um Mm, just for the sake of the audience, I will reinforce that you are in Maine, uh, 20 minutes outside of Portland, um, which is a, a wonderful uh, small city of 66,000 people. Uh, and um, that's where the acquisition of almost 200 acres with a river um, was the first step um, after um, obtaining their 501c3. So uh, the New England Animal Sanctuary has really only been operating for seven, seven or eight months, right? So that's how the, we're giving birth here today to a new organization. This is their first public appearance. So I just wanted to set that up because that's important for people to know. Although there are, yay, Sylvia, yeah. So there are many other people already doing this. And um, at some point, maybe the girls in the Q&A could talk to you if you're curious as to who else is doing what where. But for now, um, intergenerational programming is being discussed all over the world. And the New England Animal Sanctuary is being built in a naturally occurring intergenerational way. Um, can you share this inclusive vision and how that benefits your plan and your mission? You know, how, how is this intergenerational web of life working for you guys? Um, yeah, so on a personal level, um, I have found that sort of our individualistic society um, leaves people feeling really left out and isolated. Um, and so I always wanted um, and dreamed about having a family with three generations living in one roof or like um, near each other within 10 minutes or so. And that was really important to me. Um, and so we have planned and are planning, we're still doing a lot of um, planning on having our parents around and us when we have kids to, you know, be able to help us when we need it and we can help them. Um, and it's already sort of happening now with um, Deirdre's dad helping us with renovations and building barns and putting up all the infrastructure for the animals, as well as Kathy helping us with um, sort of planning the long term goals where we're talking about helping our land rewild in a way that we can work with it. Um, and it has been mismanaged for many years. So while we want to create homes for the farm animals that will be there, we also want to make sure that we're leaving space and homes for the wild animals that are living here. Um, and we are, um, and then we also, like Kathy said, we're very new. So we want to include, make sure we include programming um, that includes all types of people. We want to, you know, do art therapy with kids. We want to um, introduce soil uh, health and vegetable farming education and food system education for kids, as well as older people, um, the whole community. And we also want to introduce a sort of farming with elders um, program where we have, we give, you know, plots of land to people, 50 and above that maybe don't want to garden on their own land or don't have the land to, and they work in an after school program with kids and teach them, you know, about soil and gardening and um, growing their own food. And then at the end, they can keep whatever they grow. Um, and just veganism can be super exclusive. Um, I have found in sort of animal rights activism, people can get a little turned off by going too extreme. Um, and it was really important for me to create a space where people could meet these animals and they could act as ambassadors for the large, the horrible 
things that happen with our agriculture system today and factory farming, um, as well as a place for people to talk and learn and participate. Um, and not necessarily need to go vegan, but, um, you know, learn about different options, limiting their meat intake or... Um, we, want being, them, we want them to be vegan. <laughs> <laughs> but um but, but so we chose like systematically when we were shopping for properties this space that has two sides of a river one that will allow us to put land in conservation and one that one side that will be used for the farm animals and then we're located right across from an elementary school and both of us taught in elementary schools so they have a special ed elementary uh, school a whole school and then the regular elementary school right next to it so as we build we're aiming to create like community space to like foster programs. Actually, this week, my sister delivered, she's a nurse and she delivered the baby of the principal at the school. Oh my gosh. And so that's our first connection. And he's super open-minded to, to building these programs. So we're in a small community, um, like all cities work. The next town over that's closer to the city already has beautiful trails and land and conservation. And this formerly, primarily agricultural community does not have any of those systems in place for conservation. Um, and they don't have a lot of programs after school care, before school care that are based in education. Mostly it's just daycare facilities. So we're kind of trying specifically to work within this one town that we're in. And we we're finding that like a lot of animal sanctuaries all over the country are doing that kind of work and just keeping their work super, super local and allowing there to be a prolific amount of different sanctuaries doing work in different places instead of trying to solve a problem on a larger larger scale than that. So my vision of an intergenerational model is yes, our personal family dynamic, but also working with that elementary school that we're located right next to and letting programming uh, grow out from that affiliation as it will, but we don't have all that done yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, intergenerational is definitely part of the fiber of who you are. And, you know, when I was watching dad sit with that older cow at the sanctuary that we toured in Maine, you know, I thought, oh boy, I'm sure uh, dad's really relating to the older cow and his injuries as his knees are killing him when he's up there banging nails for you guys. So um, know, there, there is a lot of, I did want to note in, in this question, it's not really off topic. There's this sanctuary called Vine Sanctuary that's queer owned and run also. And they have a lot of conversations around aging in, term, in terms of animal rights advocacy which is like they i've heard a few lectures about how people um tend to only do their like rescue work when it comes to young animals or will be more enamored with young animals and also infantilizing older animals so like a lot of the times as humans when we're making connections to animals it's th through them being like really cute or really sweet or what a precious baby and how that is good if it comes from a place of kindness but how it can also kind of indicate like a cultural problem that we have in valuing things that are super young and not valuing lifespans which our food system and the animal agriculture food system makes really evident because most of the lifespans for the animals that we consume are they're being brought to slaughter under a year old so your you know perception of these animals living a life that's enjoyable and then being eaten as like a um, collaborative system is sort of a mythology. Uh, in, in reality, we're exploiting these animals at a super young age or keeping animals as pets at a young age and then not really providing long-term care or even considering what lifespan care looks like for an animal because it's not even relevant to us somehow. So this yeah. is just, Another conversation that's really common amongst animal rights activists is about that, the problem of infantilization and the problem with um, exploitation during these short life, lifespans. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Deirdre. I mean, I sure have felt exploited in the work world. And as I got older, you know, there are some of my colleagues on here that, you know, have concerns about ageism for human beings. And certainly when it comes to the plant and animal world, um, yeah, we don't really think about lifespan of much. So um, you really say it a lot better than I do, but um, 
Thank one, you. Little, one little example that I think is interesting that will, and these are like the particularities that sanctuary, creating a sanctuary creates problematics, right? And then in problematics, you get to have interesting conversations. So one, one of the problematics around keeping pigs in sanctuary is that if you, if you make all your bacon and ham out of animals that are six months, pigs that are six months or younger, then you don't actually know what the breeding program or the husbandry looks like around pig agriculture, right? So like if you actually took a pig and you tried to house it for its lifespan, it ends up with like serious arthritis and obesity issues because our husbandry has been so bad for the last 100 years with the like prolific growth of industrialization. So if you actually take the time to look at that creature's lifespan, if they did live it out, how much like pain and suffering and health problems there, there are, then you would never um, justify continuing to breed that animal to that size for that production. But it's really easy to see the economic drivers far outweigh the humanity, if you will, of, yeah. of uh, animal husbandry right now, yeah. in particular, with factory farming. With factory farming, exactly. And, um, you know, we're just starting to be turned on to discussions about human beings and the social determinants of health. And, and I think there are parallels uh, for sure. Um, okay, so to move on to this um, sense of place, you, you touched on it a little bit with you're very local in your mindset and uh, the sanctuary models are about more sanctuaries being local to really be a game changer of how people think and live. So um, a sense of place is really important to the connection of nature um, for all beings. And uh, why did you choose this place in Maine? And how have the land and buildings informed your plan? You know, is that different than what you thought it would be and that sort of thing? So if you could talk about how you landed in Maine and, and what that land speaks to you about. Um, so we, we ended up in Maine, uh, for several different reasons. One of them being that there weren't a lot of, um, big farm sanctuaries here. There's only one sort of well-known one, um, Peace Ridge Sanctuary. Um, they've done a really great job. And like Deirdre said, it, it um, it's a big problem to answer to. Uh, so for example, Globally, 72 billion land animals are slaughtered every year. So it's not like we're trying to provide sanctuary for every single one of those animals, but a very small amount. And if a lot of sanctuaries around the world are doing it, um, you'll, you're able to spread the message. Um, we wanted to be near a city. So we chose Portland. Her sister also lives in Portland. Um, we wanted to be close to family. My mom is in Massachusetts. Deirdre's parents are in Massachusetts. Um, we chose the land that we're on because it was over a hundred acres. We wanted a little bit of cleared land for, you know, cows and horses, um, that do like to have a lot of pasture. Um, but we also chose a piece of land that wasn't completely clear cut. We really, um, don't want that model at our sanctuary. Uh, a lot of people think that farm animals only have to be you know, on pasture and that's it and clear cut everything and just fence squares. Um, but we are educating ourselves. We don't know everything, but we're educating ourselves on ways to house the animals um, a lot, working with nature, you know, pigs, goats, even horses, they can all be in majority woods with a little bit of pasture. Um, we really want to keep up as many trees as possible. Um, and this place has a lot of trees. Luckily, the guy that owned it before loved hunting. Um, so he kept the trees up and he didn't clear cut. I don't love that he was a trophy hunter, but that's a personal thing. Um, and so, yeah, that's why we, do you have anything to add? We ended up here. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. There yeah. is a, there is a huge problem, um, with invasive species and there's a whole conversation to be said around um, what now, because the ecosystem is so out of whack, the amount of work that you have to do now to, to actually maintain a wild space is much more prolific than we anticipated. Um, so we're going to try to pair with U University of New England, Maine, which is just in the next town over to get some of the students over there to run some, because they have a forestry 
department and PhD program to run some programming. And that's what the Conservation Trust has done in, in the other town. They, they pair with the university to try to talk about like, how to maintain these wild spaces when the ecosystem is disrupted because you actually have to do protective work to be able to just have a wild space, which is pretty um, deeply screwed up, but it is what it, it is what it is and it's not going to be able to be something that we can deal with on our own. I just am becoming familiarized with like the amount of programs graduate programs that there are in forestry forest management land management there's so many different uh, levels to that that I wasn't aware of, but uh, uh, I'm going to just uh, inter interrupt here because uh, Margaret Young put in an interesting uh, comment in the chat. She said uh, that uh, she hadn't, you know, the thoughts that you've been bringing up are new to her, but she said it would be interesting then to explore the parallel about what you've been thinking about in relationship to animals with trees and what activism uh, that, that in relationship to trees and forest might be appropriate as far as policies are concerned. Uh, and I know uh, Peter Whitehouse, who is also called Sylvanus, uh, because he's, the tr he's uh, our tree doctor, uh, might have comments on that as well. Uh, what what kinds of, of treatment uh, uh, it's not uh, would would be have you thought about in relationship to trees does that make quite sense yeah it makes perfect sense we're like i said i'm super undereducated in forest management but the there's two primary invasive species that we've been working on keeping down this year just to like not have them take over our trees so just since being on the land, like all of the spruce trees are dying from this, um, like, what's it? It's, it's a living organism called mistletoe, and it looks like someone threw a wreath up into a spruce tree. So the spruce trees are all dying. We have a really good sugar maple stand that's doing well. There's an invasive vine called um, honeysuckle and bittersweet, and those wrap around the trees and try to take them down. So we're kind of, um, we're kind of trying to to get rid of those through mowing, it seems like best practice is to use like a pesticide of some kind. Um, but I'm, this is where we are really like needing to involve other people because I don't want to brashly introduce something to the environment that I'm not completely sure on how it works. But getting to know the tree, the birch trees up here are suffering um, as their roots are too warm, they're dying, uh, they're used to living in a colder climate. So so there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of work in the science of figuring out which particular species to foster. It's really romantic to be like, oh, this beautiful green space, isn't it wonderful? But maybe it isn't always. And so there's a lot of management to do in there. But yeah, and your property um, on the other side of the river, there it was. Uh... I don't know if it was clear cut, but certainly select cut. Yeah, we see it was logged. It was logged. So that's yeah. what happens in areas where there's like a lot of logging or clearing for farming is that like the first story or the first level that will come back, if it doesn't come back healthy or as like part of the native ecosystem, then you'll have an invasive species take over. And then there's like a lack of biodiversity. And then the next story can't come up through the way it's meant to, or it destroys anything that's left existing. I heard this interesting point. I just wanted to um, say it because it like popped into my world this week. But in the United States, like during times of segregation, we had this this practice in all cities called redlining, which is like where there would be like a red outline on a city map of what was supposed to be a black neighborhood and a white neighborhood. And then now someone recently did a study that's finding in the US like all of the red line neighborhoods from segregation are five to 10 degrees warmer than the non redlined neighborhoods in any given city. And that's because the city would pour a lot of money into planting trees and putting parks in the neighborhoods that were primarily white or not redlined. And now that's having like a long term um, impact on those communities and will as, gl as global warming continues to shift and change and um, the environment continues to shift and change. So areas where people are making direct investments into um, supporting the local ecosystem, planting trees will have uh, 
an ability to combat some of these issues of global warming in a way that low income areas where like everything is being extracted, exploited, uh, segregated, ghettoized will not. And so even in this Maine is primarily white, you still have issues of classism um, in these areas that were formerly agricultural that then are clear cut for hanging and then these suburbs or trailer parks go in if they're not rewilded correctly or with management or with funding from the state, you can have some of those similar similar issues arise where it's actually all all very complex and all requires a lot of funding and science because things aren't self-correcting the way that they once were and the same with the animal agriculture where you it's it's imaginary that these systems are functioning when they're not thank you Deirdre. um so we did take a little um walk off the questions but what a beautiful walk it was thank you jan and margaret for that um connection back to the trees uh i'll take it quick just to um one small question and then we're going to open it up to everybody because it is 50 50 time um you know your sanctuary will care for many beings everybody's just heard trees plants farm animals people um what other beings are you thinking about or have we covered them all just like red beans, black beans, lima beans. Not beans, you silly goose, beings. <laughs> You're so funny. All the beans will be protected. Um, great, dude. I think like Annie said, the only part that we're not stressing is like trying trying to move forward with some of those small scale local food systems projects, like getting people farming, um, even learning together about how to farm in a successful way that's not exploitative of the environment. like. We're really yeah. trying to create space for people to ask difficult questions, ask about the things that are broken, give us criticisms on what's not making sense, um, and not try to make it all make perfect sense, but let it be like a series of problems. And always yeah. just having faith in best intentions and that we'll draw to ourselves the people that are looking to do the work. Yeah, great. So, you know, um, I know there are many older people all around the world that are working on great things and um, asking us for help, asking us to be your council of elders um, and, and do those reflections with you so we can grow and help you grow. I, I think there's a lot of boomers around the world that would be um, at your disposal to, to do just that. I really, that's why these people have showed up here today. So um, thank you for that. Is that appropriate, Osnat, for the transition back to? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I think that um, it's because we have people from all over the world here, and uh, so situations are so different. But I think that the, still this basic question about, so what memories or attitudes about nature were passed on to you uh, from your elders? And in contrast to that, what memories or attitudes about nature would you want to pass on to future generations? I mean, when I was growing up, uh, uh, I think of I think that nature was what we went we drove out on Sunday afternoons uh, into the into the countryside to enjoy the scenery that was provided by nature because I lived in a city. And um, I think that, um, I, that it was other, <laughs> nature was other. It was a backdrop. Uh, what all that we did with it in, uh, was in our backyard to raise a bush or maybe a, a couple vegetables. But there was no, not the interaction uh, or, from my perspective, what I feel has been a conversion for me in the last year to understand that human beings are not superior. They're not making use of what's in nature. Human beings are just one more species along with the animals and the trees. And to, I think there's such exciting information now about in books like the overstory or fantastic fungi or the intelligence of trees to show us how animals and trees and all other plants can communicate 
Uh, so it's a very different perspective, a hugely different perspective of nature that I have now than I had previously. And thank God I've lived this long uh, to, have, to have that change. As, as Deirdre and Annie speak, I feel, my God, I, I'm so happy that we can be, I can be on the same wavelength now, you know. It's, it's, uh, is this a change that can take over? It's important everywhere. I'd love to hear from any of you. Uh, uh, Alasnet and Moira and, uh, are here. Who, has, who wants to put a hand up to speak? What memories or attitudes about nature were passed on to you? And do you have different ones now? Valerie. Valerie, Valerie from Wales. Yes, Valerie from Wales. Very rural community in Wales. I live in the Brecon Beacons National Park where we have lots and lots of trees and we're planting lots more trees. Um, what did I learn from my grandmother? Lots of little things. Lots of little things that really make sense. Like when you're picking blackberries, add some elderberries in and then the jam will set. Take care, use, make do and mend. That's what we did. I was born in 1941, so I'm now 81. And my memories go back to not the war, I don't remember the war, but I remember that we didn't waste anything. We used everything. I am now re-knitting a sweater from a wool sweater that is, has got to, was too tight for me. I've unpicked it and I'm re-knitting it because you can't waste good quality wool. I want to say a word about the girls and their attitude to animals. I think it's a beautiful attitude, but I do eat meat. I eat meat because I like to see the lambs running in the fields around me here. I like to see our Welsh cattle up on the mountains. If we don't eat them, they are not pets. They are livestock. They are there for us to eat. What they also do is with their droppings and, and their, their urine, uh, urine too, they're adding goodness to the soil. We're depleting our soils. We're losing insects. When my children were young and I took them to school, we used to have to stop and clean the windscreen from insects. Do you have to do that now in America? We don't have to do that anymore. Um, I was very distressed this year that I always have swifts coming from Africa and bringing their young up and in the eaves under my cottage. That no, none came this year. That's the first time the swifts have not come. Swifts hunt in packs to get the insects. There aren't enough insects, and swifts are now an endangered species. Being kind to all of our planet is the only way forward. And I'm afraid we are part of the problem. There are too many people in the world, and we have to actually think seriously about where those people are going to live as the sea levels rise. Counties like Florida will cease to exist. My son, who was a teacher in Ithaca for many years, is now retired and moved to Denmark with his new wife. Denmark is going to have big, serious problems. Countries like Tuvalu only have a height of two meters as their maximum height. Where are all those people going to go? As we're using farming land more and more for growing trees and also for housing, where is enough food going to come from? These are very serious problems. Can I quickly just mention an intergenerational project that I'm working on? I'm going to send it all to Moira so that she can send it round to you by email because it's, it's a bit long. But um, a few years ago, I was speaking in UNESCO in Paris and now they have got a Mother Language Day, which is a UNESCO World, World, World Project. And um, using the internet, 
we can create stories. The stories could be about the, the animal sanctuary that the girls are creating. The stories can be about anything. We older people, um, all the skills for creating stories have been around for generations. What we lacked was the missing link, was how to create those, turn those stories into ebooks. Ebooks are better for the environment. They don't use paper. They don't, they don't cost anything to transport. Um, ebooks are brilliant. Um, they could also include film uh, and audio. So you can have the story told in the mother language and then translated into English or indeed any of the other major languages so that it becomes a dual language learning tool. All of this I put into a, an email to Moira and I hope she'll send it round to you all because I want to promote the UNESCO Mother Language Project and I'm working on a presentation for that day, it'll be in February, and I would like as many stories from as many countries in as many languages as we can possibly have. Great, thank you so much, Valerie. Wow. What other uh, hand, hands up here? Peter? To thank you for um, that comment. Um, I was in Wales relatively recently, and though that did make me think of uh, Celtic, and I just wonder whether um, Valerie has any uh, roots that go back deeper than her 81 years. Um, but it, it's, it's more a comment um, that also promoted about the conversation about whether we eat um, animals or we go vegan or vegetarian. I, I, to me, uh, a sanctuary with animals has lots of lessons about death. And it seems to me that that is a real topic for us as we face climate crisis and as we face elderhood, both the death of a species and the death of ourselves as individuals. I wonder, uh, Annie and Deidre, if you could just comment about what you think the lessons of your work are for people to appreciate the differences between plants and animals and what it means to be a creature that has limited mor mortality. Um, thank you, Peter. Yeah, so Valerie, and thank you for your comments. We're not here to judge people or, you know, say you can't eat meat. Um, I just, um, we would like to spread the message and the education that we've taken on um, to better inform people. So they know, you know, Large Ag has done a really good job of sort of um, blinding people to what actually goes on. So globally, about 90% of meat that's sold is factory farmed. And in the US, it's 99% of meat that is sold is factory farmed. Factory farmed means that they are um, in very, there's, they're treated like items, products, not like sentient beings. They're crammed in warehouse type buildings. Um, they don't see sunshine, they don't see grass, um, they're pumped with antibiotics that is, can create a really scary antibiotic resistance. Um, they're slaughtered really fast in a really inhumane way. Um, the people that work in these factory farms and slaughterhouses are not paid well. A lot of times they're undocumented workers. Um, so in the US, I'm talking specifically, sorry. Um, and so they are not treated fairly. And a lot of times, um, many whistleblowers have shown that the insensitivity to the people that are working in these places then translates to the insensitivity on the animals um, and really inhumane practices that go on. Um, yeah, I think that that's where, like Peter, you were saying lifespan creates um like i'm really depressive at this point in my life about uh, these like facts and not stories that are pretty devastating to our environmental future and he's really passionate still about creating a space where like a few individuals can be spared from um from this like really toxic culture that we've created and that we don't discuss so 
the the passion behind that has to do with lifespan directly right because when you have a pet dog or something you know your dog is going to live eight to ten years you want to do everything that you can for them if you're enjoying um lambs and sheep you want to see them out on pasture even if you come to what you think about eating animals or you know how many people are allowed to eat animals and we still don't have the greenhouse gases that we have you could do all the numbers on that and arrive at different points but when you have a sentient being, which is different than a plant in my perception, that has a limited lifespan, it, it, it quality of life matters. And um, the numbers of individuals that are having a good quality of life versus individuals that are having a poor quality of life matters. And so that's where it's really easy when you get into rescue work to become really like, uh, really aware of how short life is and really aware of how easy it is to become very apathetic towards mass suffering. And we do that all the time with people, we do it with animals. Because when you're confronted, whatever situation you're in, you're confronted directly with the fact that like our time on earth, ourselves and our animal companions, very fleeting, a lot of it is spent poorly. And uh, how to alleviate that becomes impossible within global capitalism. So uh, doubling down on, doubling down on the reality of how our global economy works becomes more important uh, to justify why would you bash your head against a wall to save a, a few, a few individuals because each individual lifespan does matter and how that time spent does matter. And that, that does have a spiritual impact on all of us. Uh, if I could just answer that very quickly, um, there's an answer, buy local. I don't, would not dream of buying imported meat from America or South America. Um, I buy local. I buy from the local butcher who knows where the animals come from. I buy, um, I love to buy from the shop, the gate, uh, when people set, put vegetables out at their gate. Buying local helps the local economy and you get fresher, better food with less packaging and less air mileages. So that's very answer that. And to um, Peter, yes, I do have Celtic origins. I, I do uh, think that Valerie has a wonderful point that we have been uh, expanding dramatically in the US the opportunities for community gardens for for uh, farmers markets, for uh, 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 different approaches to make sure that quality of life is more available to more animals. But even so, uh, we do what we, what, 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 uh, what we do is what we can do. And uh, we, we need to do. Uh, Jacqueline has raised her hand. Is that right, Jackie? Yeah, talking about memories, um, I see the complete difference now, uh, the life I had as a child, the memories that I had. Um, every, every year when school was out, uh, we packed up the car and went camping in a place where there was no electricity, no running water, no toilets. Uh, you had to go down to the, some house and we spent the whole summer in the, in the woods. And that's, I think, what our par my parents gave us, that opportunity. But unfortunately, um, if you're living in a, in a city like in Vienna, it's a whole completely different world that you, the children probably wouldn't want to go camping anymore and sleep on, in sleeping bags on the ground and things like that. But I think the, the, mem the, the feelings I have about nature and stuff came from that time going fishing, knowing where the salamanders were, knowing where the worms were, um, to, to do all these different things. But um, it's really a different world. Um, but here in Vienna, actually five minutes away from where we live, is a beautiful park. It's called the Algarten. And in front of the Algarten, they have big areas set off for city gardening. People get sign up and get plots to um, plant their uh, vegetables or sunflowers or whatever they want and it's yeah it's a it's a it's about a a good half a kilometer long that people maybe about 200 people have a chance to have a little garden in the city um, but 
that's nothing like your sanctuary. But I was interested in asking the question, how are you funding your dream? Um, luckily for us, at the start of this, we have some excellent private donors who have given us the opportunity to get off our feet. And then we have like done a lot of research through on um, these different models. Like most sanctuaries will put out a book, and then like as you can see on their website, they'll have their funding plan and and everything. And uh, most animal sanctuaries operate by donation. So you you staff to the extent that you can, and you expand to the extent that you can based on the donations that you're receiving. Um, so we have our startup money and then we scale from there based on interest, which is, but, uh, hopefully like, and I think that will be the importance of creating some of these programs. Like you said, the, the community gardens and stuff like that sounds really extensive and a beautiful resource. So we're going to kind of just go to town on providing community resources. Hopefully we, we can like engage people to want to participate to the extent that they can. Um, uh Thank you for that question. Uh, with we're running so short in time now, I'm just going to mention for others who have raised their hand, uh, Michelle Ricard. Michelle, you, uh, you're on, you're muted. Okay, there we, there we go. go. Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. Um, echo what I think it was Annie had said earlier about the total misinformation about where our food comes from and the information about the health of our food. Um, I am vegan also, but I like to say that I'm whole food plant-based because I think that that puts a different emphasis on, you know, why we're eating what we are. And um, <clears throat> I'm trying to do my best to put out educational information out there to groups of people talking about um, why eating whole food plant-based is good, not just the fact of not eating animals. Uh, that becomes a secondary benefit, but I'm, you know, at heart at being a retired physician, my interest is in people's health and um, the benefit to the animals is sort of like second hand, if you will. It's not my primary concern, but I just wanted to absolutely share that the, um, particularly with Dr. Um, Colin Campbell's work, you know, showing what awful you know, misinformation has been uh, perpetrated on the public um, by government sources and other things like that. Um, we really need to be, make ourselves aware of and educate ourselves on the benefits of eating plants. So I just wanted to echo that. And thank you, Annie and Deirdre, for, uh, for mentioning that. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and Sorry. You sorry, just a quick response to Michelle. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I actually brought three books that changed my life and really helped me get into veganism. One of them being the China study, which Michelle just mentioned, Dr. Colin Campbell. Um, and he just does a 15 year long nutrition study and he started his college career thinking meat and dairy was the best thing in the world and then spent many years studying it and realized that whole foods plant-based is the way to go. So highly suggest the China study for anyone interested. Right, what are the other two just for curiosity? Um, Jean Bauer's Farm Sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Animals and Food. He has a very large operation that's done a lot of good in the world. And actually someone in the chat had a question about where we're going to rescue our animals from. And we are trying to work with them. They have a network, they adopt out um, farm animals because they're almost at capacity now. So they now have smaller sanctuaries they reach out to because they're so well known. Um, and then Mad Cowboy, Plain Truth from the Cattle Rancher Who Won't Eat Meat. He was at, this is Howard Lyman. He was on the Oprah show and actually was sued by um, the beef industry, I guess, a specific one, I don't, I'm not sure which, but um, really interesting guy and story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Rubin, you had a, a, a question? Yes, I did. Um, hold on a second. I, very interesting points. I really appreciate what you have to say, ladies. Um, but the comment about funding your program, and you said uh, a lot of this is through donations. Uh, have you thought about this in terms of, of it be, being self-sustaining? You know, I think there's much more that could come out of this that I don't know if you've begun to think about it. 
in terms of, of how you can, can achieve your goals while at the same time uh, generate income. I, I, I put a link in, in the um, chat uh, about a place called Urban Farm in Denver uh, that was started years ago. And uh, they're doing some pretty interesting stuff in terms of generating revenue to be self-sustaining. But more than that, uh, when I was growing up, I was growing up uh, outside New York City in the 1950s, and they had a, a, a an ad campaign for something called the Fresh Air Fund. And it was for inner city children who never got out of this, they never went to, to a farm or what have you, and they'd say, to a little boy of about five or six. Have you ever seen a cow, Timothy? No. Well, contribute to the Fresh Air Fund. If we wanna change mindsets and introduce people to new ways of thinking, uh, that may be an avenue to explore. How do we get people from an urban environment to come out and see what you're talking about? And maybe generate the kind of thinking that they're not exposed to otherwise. Just a thought. Any, any comments in response to that? Annie and Deirdre? Um, we are in proximity to the city for, for that reason, to be able to have the city be just a part of our community, not necessarily an outreach, but that we're all in that community together. And then Interestingly enough, like you'll have a lot of kids in these rural schools who also haven't been on a farm or spent time fishing or hunting or doing anything. They're sitting in their rooms on video games. Exactly. So and much. If, if we've got one more minute, I want to recommend this book, which is, can you read it? So David Attenborough's A Life on This Planet. This is a man, a little older than us, Jan, but not much older, um, who has been there, done that, seen it all develop this man every this every man woman and child on this planet should read this book i uh, uh valerie you'll be happy to know that there is a uh public broadcasting program called green planet yes that's shown once a month here uh and you, you perhaps uh, see that also probably it originates in the uk yeah but i i just think it's a marvelous program and david Ottenborough is the person. Uh, the, the last one in the rainforest reminded me of our last program, which was held in the rainforest. We need to do a wrap up now uh, because was, of the time. He was brilliant. Okay. He was brilliant at the COP. I was a speaker, a minor speaker at the COP. He was electrifying. We, we definitely. At, at 90, 96, I think he is now. Yeah. Right, that's great. Keep this going and keep dancing and you'll live longer and be happy. Wonderful, great. Uh, I do want to uh, uh, turn it over to Peter at this point for a couple of minutes uh, because I, uh, Peter will take responsibility for the next session, which I believe is August 15th. And at that time, uh, he will be uh, uh, reviewing the comments that have been coming through the three first sessions uh, for, again, talking about the opportunities for reweaving the web of life. Peter, do you have any comments as a, uh, a preparatory? We will be meeting and uh, exploring questions to throw out to the audience in advance if you wish to do that. Uh, what, what would you like to say to us about next month? So the first is we want to hear from you. Um, I'm, I'm glad I have a long memory as a tree because to go back all the way to June, uh, Ju May, excuse me. And just to remind those of you that couldn't participate in all of those, we had um, uh, Ethan uh, from Canada and the Legacy Project where they're developing um, ecologically friendly communities with trees in their theme uh, in Canada. Uh, after that, we had um, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to those of you that were here early, the uh, Chief Shirley uh, Cranach from the Cranach Chime in one of the ra other rainforests besides the Amazon in, um, in Brazil. And uh, then, of course, we've heard and enjoyed the session today from New England with a little bit of Celtic thrown in. 
each of these have been an intergenerational conversation. And I guess I, I, I just want to ask, pass it on, um, just what the it is. I mean, that to me, that's to me, what I've been reading about a lot recently is elderhood. Um, what is the difference between an older person and being an elder? And the indigenous peoples and the Celtic folks, um, those, those that have lived closer to nature, and, and, and Jan said it rightly, that um, we in modern times have lost that intimate connection uh, to varying degrees in varying places. So uh, what I'm interested in personally is to say, okay, what do we take from these three intergenerational conversations that have included trees and this deep connection to nature and this deep commitment to changing the, our civilization? How do we, as members of the Pass It On Network, take those lessons into our own elderhood? And I will end up with one last thing. I, I raised it in my question to this group. Um, I'm reading uh, a man by the name of uh, Stephen Jenkinson, um, who talks an awful lot about the importance of reframing lots of things in civilization. One of those is the, the joy and wonder we feel in being, whether we're a tree or a lamb or whatever. Um, there, there is that feeling of vitality of being alive, which is juxtaposed to the fact that we are mortal. But I don't want to presume um, the conversation. I want to take it with the rest of the team here, reflect on what has happened in the, in, in the three sessions before, and prepare something that I hope will be interactive, that can allow us each to take away from this, those are sessions we've attended and those that we haven't tested, something that makes a meaning difficult, meaningful difference in what it means for us to be, if not elders yet, elders to be. Uh, and again, chronological age does not give you the crone, does not give you the elderhood. What, how can we be better elders so that we can help these young folks do all this amazing work, some of which we've heard today? Jan, is that a helpful kind of seed that says something about where we might go? But also Absolutely. Uh, and I, but I think that uh, uh, Deirdre and Annie also have turned the tables on us to some degree because they have themselves shown, I believe, how millennials are benefiting from seeing the lifespan for what it is uh, and for shifting attitudes about life to think about lifespan. Uh, that, that, I think, probably stems from their own experience with Con the consciousness raising that's occurred, thanks to Kathy Bailey and others. But uh, I think that uh, both, both young and old here have a lot to gain, uh, not only from immersion in, in, nat the, in sense of nature, uh, but the understanding of, of, of aging of all, for all species. So let me just say I agree with you completely. Uh, I say in our intergenerational public schools that we're trying to make those elementary school kids older faster. What do I mean by that? I don't mean it chronologically. I mean the wisdom that emerges from this conversation from the younger folks needs to be harvested too. Maybe you don't have to be older to be an elder. You can get, get that kind of life experience deeply from your elders but also from living life close to nature. So let's not make this a thing, as you said, Jan, that you just have to wait to be some certain age before you're eligible. Right. We're all eligible to deepen our humanity by connecting to nature at any age. It is a life course, a life can, uh, span perspective. And yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, uh, and Jan, and Jan, this is Kathy. I just, I just wanted to add to that for Peter and Jan. Um, you know, one of the big uh, mind openers that I've experienced is uh, the fact that people talk about not just human rights anymore. They talk about rights for everyone. And so like for the past, you know, 16 years of aging advocacy, uh, you know, where I found myself at the United Nations and working on the intergenerational model UN and thinking about the SDGs, but a lot of it was about getting this human rights for older persons going. And all of a sudden I had to pause and think, is that enough? And having known 
the person that wrote the dictionary for the human rights under Eleanor Roosevelt. I really wish he was alive today because I would like to ask him, was there ever a conversation about rights beyond that for the human? And how would our world look today if there were? So I just want to put that out there for the next session, Peter. Wonderful. It's wonderful uh, opening. I do want to make sure that everyone realizes that, that, that this is a recording and that those recordings from all three sessions are available, will be available, and that you will receive a notice because you have registered uh, uh, about uh, when, when the recording from this session is available to join the other two so that you can refresh yourself and make use of that in other ways. Um, it's time for Moira to do a wrap up. And I just wanna say thank you, thank you to Kathy and to Annie and to Deirdre. Uh, we have learned so much from you uh, and uh, it's been done in a way that I think that each of us can reflect for ourselves upon our own experience. And that's true learning, thank you. I just want to return the thank you. Thank you so much for creating the space for us um, and opening the space for us as a as a startup to have somewhere where we can feel like justified and supported and conversational in what we're doing. I think it's really cool what you guys are doing here. Thank you. Thank you. Good. We definitely look forward to hearing how you're getting on. So oh, yeah, everyone, everyone come up or the website will be live. I'll send out the link and we'll be open for visitors within the year. That would be wonderful. Get or we'll all come. You better be careful. No, I can't wait. That's the idea. Okay, so um, I just want to share a little thought that I had today because I was listening to Dr. Emma Makara in, uh, in Nigeria and she came up with this quote and I think it's just so interesting and also appropriate. She was just saying that aging is everybody's future. <laughs> I thought that was really good. So it, um, it remains for us to say thank you to everybody. Thank you so much, Kathy, for your hard work. And I'm sure it wasn't hard work because I know that you were up to that and enjoying it and <laughs> doing what you really want to do. And I think that is, um, that is the essence of living. If we all did what we love to do, we wouldn't be working and it would be so energizing, so very energizing. So thank you, Kathy, to you. And thank you to, to the girls who've come along and been with us, Dead Ray and, and Annie. And then really, this is going to be a wrap up session that you don't want to miss on the 15th of August, where we're going to maybe have some calls to action for all of us and all of us that can consider. And we're going to be working hard with Peter to go through all the comments that we've collected over these three sessions and bring them together um, in the fourth session. And then I'd also just like to mention in September, then the 50-50 will, uh, will be with um, the Grey Panthers, with Jack Kupferman. And what we're going to do there is to try to explore whether the message that Maggie Kuhn had 50 years ago is as relevant as it was then in our lives. So thank you once again. I would just like you to, I would just like you to go to the chat where you'll find a link and if you can do it just before we, we sign off, there's a little short questionnaire, which we really appreciate getting feedback on because that gives us the possibility to improve as we go along with this 50-50 series, which is now into its second year. And we've thoroughly enjoyed it. We enjoyed having Val with us um, uh, earlier and so many people had to come through that. So from my side, I think that is what I wanted to say. And Jan, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Or oh, Osnet? No? Jan is on mute. I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> and all that I have to say is thank you. Everyone who participated, it's such a such a pleasure. Good. Thank you very much. And then I'm going to invite you to do something that Carrie Henley taught us all to do. Bravo. <laughs> and we all look forward to the next one. Instead of clapping, we rub our hands. And that's become quite a, quite a well-known thing around on these Zoom calls. And um, I'm sorry we didn't get to talk to Dr. Mamsi Motsega. 
perhaps you could just show us and greet us because you came in late, so we didn't have the opportunity of seeing you or speaking to you. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you once again to everybody and we'll see you on the 15th of August and then again on the 19th of September and you'll get information from us as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.